Greetings and a very warm good afternoon to all of you. And today is our proud privilege to be accorded the opportunity of showcasing our department and the good work we have done. And we also welcome our stalwarts, Professor Dinda, Professor Deepak, Professor Garg, Professor Ray, Professor Geeta, and Professor Usha Panjwani and my dear colleagues, Professor Ashok Jaryal and Professor Suman Jain and our dear faculty and staff, students and guests from other departments. So as we all know, over the last three decades, the Department of Physiology has evolved in multi dimensions, not just a teaching department, but having many domains as we are showing here and many laboratories uh, spanning two blocks, the teaching block and the convergence block and from basic applied and translational research we are also providing a range of clinical services. We have already presented some grand rounds in the past decade on uh, integral health clinic autonomic function testing, vascular function testing and in the series of welcome uh, these endeavors today we are having a grand round on how we can use RTMS and nano biotechnology or nano medicine based up novel approaches in Theranostics for managing spinal cord injury. It's my pleasant duty to invite my faculty colleague Professor Ashok Jaryal, who is well known for doing many innovations and as I say, he is a quaternary I am not just a trinity for academics, research and clinical care, but also we learn many tips from administration. He is a past associate dean and we learn a lot from our youngsters and he has been operational in starting many clinical services in the department and joining us all together including the intraoperative neurophysiological services. Dr. Kshot, please just introduce what we all do and then I will give the hand over to Dr. Suman Jain. Thank you ma'am for your kind words. Uh, department as a physiology, of course by its name we come to the basic department uh, but we are in a medical institution with the goal of clinical research and teaching. And as a result, our department has taken that challenge and over a period of decades expanded into various domains. I will briefly take you through the, the expanse of that we have so that many of you would, uh, who are listening here as well as away uh, from uh, uh, remotely would be aware of what we do and our future co collaborations can come into the picture. We welcome our uh, 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 past SOD Professor K.K. Deepa. So, this is the range that world speaks about basics to clinical from what we call the bench, bench to bedside, bedside to bench. The department has various domains. I will touch upon each slide on one one domain. So, we work at the animal level, we work at the human level to understand the basic physiology as to what is happening. Ultimately, this all will translate into research someday. But the primary work, this is what we are sharing with you, the cardiovascular mechanisms in human beings various neurophysiology, speech processing, Indian classical music, how it affects, motor planning, all these components various uh, departments, uh, various uh, laboratories in, the, in the, our, our department are doing. At the same time, animal research is core for any, any good institution and uh, the history of uh, AIMS has a, uh, has a large amount of uh, laboratories we're working in animal studies and we are continuing with that. So these are the areas that the feeding behavior, learning behaviors, gait analysis, pain studies, of course sleep and thermoregulation has been with us for, for about four decades now with Professor B. Mohan Kumar and Dr. H. N. Malik, the gut brain access, cortical reorganization, the newer areas of cortical plasticity are also being done in our department. This is regarding the primary basic. However, the bulk of our work comes in the translational research because at AIMS we get the patient group, we have the know-how of physiology and we can bring them together. No other institution in the country will have this kind of amalgamation of 
fantastic basic tools available in the institution as well as the patient group and the faculties in clinical department and the basic department to come together. So neurophysiology of course is the central of our, uh, of our department's history and you can see that we are just touching on almost all domains, I mean this is just a sample. If I were to take out each and every disease of the, this is what we are happening in the last 5 years perhaps. If you took out the history, maybe we will need 10-15 slides to cover up the whole department and you will realize that almost all departments of the institution are, have interacted with the Department of Physiology for these purposes. However, all the translational research must ultimately land up in clinical valuation, routine patient services. And that also is part of our departmental goal. And so we began largely with Professor Deepak when he started the autonomic function testing for cardiovascular functions. And we do about 800 to 1000 tests a year for last 20-25 years it has been going on. The integral health clinic was started by Professor R. L. Bijlani and now Professor uh, Rajkumar is handling that very well. And so we have these two week sessions, uh, three, four, three to four, five sessions running in parallel, about 400 sessions per year and a large number of patients are being benefited directly as an outcome of the research that has been done in this department. Similarly, uh, under the blessings of the department, we started up the interoperative neurophysiology and we are supporting about 400 surgeries per year for the Department of Orthopedics, Dr. Professor Bhavuk is here. Uh, for his spine surgeries and uh, for various uh, surgeons in the department of neurosurgery. Uh, two, three years back we started with the esophageal pressure manometry. We are doing about 550 uh, testing per year. Recently we have added up the preoperative cardiopulmonary function testing in the respiratory uh, laboratory wherein the preoperative patients are on a case to case basis are being sent to the department for evaluation. There is something we feel very happy about that, that whatever knowledge that department has acquired and the expertise is available is directly helping the patient outcome. Uh, body composition an analysis, uh, again this is offered for all staff of the institution and they come, they get the body composition an analysis done for their, uh, for their use. And recently we have established biofeedback and hopefully that all these technologies and many more such services will be an outcome. With this I will come back to Professor Kocher and uh, ask uh, her to introduce the topic and Dr. Suman Jain, the crux of what we have reached, the neurophysiology and coming to the translation research and manifesting as a new dimension in treatment for patients with spinal cord injuries. Thank you Dr. Ashok and I welcome Dr. Bal also. Thank you. We, I think we should proceed with, the, we have a lot to cover. Good afternoon everyone. So uh, today I will be presenting the translational work which we have been doing in the department for last two decades that is transcranial magnetic stimulation and nanotechnology based novel theranostics in spinal cord injury. Spinal cord injury as you know is one of the most prevalent problems of modern society. Every year there are approximately 20,000 20, people which are having undergoing injury. But to add to that, what is more important and significant is that around 1.5 million people in India are living with spinal cord injury. It's such a pathetic condition and they're totally dependent on their near and dear ones and therefore contributing to a huge societal burden. And most of them are males in the age group of 20 to 49 years. And if you look at the Indi globally, India is amongst the countries who have uh, very high annual incidences that is around 12 persons per lakh people. So it has a very, very high annual incidence of spinal cord injury. Most of these patients have thoracolumbar injury in uh, Asia A scale. So why, and if you look at the India, then it is more uniformly distributed. So it is not that any one area or any one city has more prevalence. It is throughout India uniformly. Uh, we are getting patients throughout India. Why spinal cord injury? Why we are talking of spinal cord injury? And therefore, what are the challenges? Primary impact of spinal cord injury, as you can see, is generally actually results in uh, severing of the spinal cord and therefore loss of ascending and descending cracks and loss of neural corrections and therefore leading to sensory and motor loss, paraplegia or quadriplegia. But then it initiates a cascade of events, uh, initiates a cascade of events wherein there is oxidative stress, apoptosis, excitotoxicity, ischemia, inflammation and so on and so forth, which spreads both caudally and rostrally and therefore covering most uh, larger areas of the spinal cord resulting in degeneration of neurons and the uh, glial cells and extracellular matrix and therefore and then it culminates in a scar formation scar formation is uh, both a mechanical barrier that means it 
prevents the regenerating axons to cross the lesion site and therefore prevents any formation or establishment of the neural connections as well as this is a chemical barrier wherein it releases lot of inhibitory molecules like novo a and therefore making the micro environment uh, inhibitory to any further repair or recovery or regeneration and that's why these people once the scar is formed then the injury patients cannot just recover so they are in that condition and they have to survive for long year, long many years therefore there is a need for a therapeutic strategy to understand the mechanism or device to devise a therapeutic strategy which can uh, hit all these targets which can focus at all these targets and magnetic field stimulation or transcranial magnetic field stimulation is one such strategy so this uh, the studies in the department started in around 2003 when i joined the department as faculty then professor rashmi mathu she was planning to start spinal cord injury work along with the tms or magnetic field stimulation and so both of us we standardized various incomplete complete hemi section models of uh, uh, the spinal cord injury and looked at various aspects behavior uh, biochemical morphological and physiological mechanisms of uh, magnetic field briefly what we observed was that there was a significant improvement in locomotor function after mf exposure for 5 to 8 weeks there was a sensory motor recovery the glasses was significantly reduced after mf exposure the lesion volume was reduced and there was axon regeneration recently we have also shown that not only the magnetic field stimulation once you give has an effect on spinal cord injury but also affects the muscle so we know that if there whenever there is a spinal cord injury it is associated with muscle atrophy so if this is a uh, diagram of anti gravity muscle soleus muscle so you can see in injury there is a degeneration of this muscle c delta fiber lesion hypertrophy lesion and there is lot of inflammation but after magnetic field stimulation there is restoration of the architecture of muscle as well as this r indicates that it is actually inducing myogenesis also so new muscle fibers are being formed so that was a very significant result which we have recently published in 21 now while we were working on that uh, professor mathu she in 2005 handed me this paper which was by helpern and it had come out in 1998 which say, showed that in in vitro culture neuronal culture if you inject nanoparticles and then exposed to magnetic fields it results in exonal exonal sprouting and regeneration so we thought that the, okay this is happening is it only in in vitro or is it applicable in in vivo condition also therefore we started working on that from 2005 onwards and we again published a series of uh, papers on that uh, so but to be able to use iron oxide nanoparticles it is very important that first you have to check the cytotoxicity and therefore we did uh, in glioblastoma cultures in co collaboration with biochemistry department we did cytotoxicity studies and we found that till 100 microgram of nanoparticles there was no injury and the survival rate of the neurons was uh, quite good so this is the brief experimental design in which we had uh, four groups one was injury group in what one another one we injected only the nanoparticles third we inject exposed them only to the magnetic fields and then there was a combination therapy so uh, again in collaboration and under the guidance able kindness of professor dinda who is an expert in nanotechnology we fabricated the uh, nanoparticles and we embedded them in a hydrogel initially we did in agros but then uh, we uh, did in gelatin gelatin hydrogel system and this was injected at the lesion site here so the thracolumbar lesion we did at l1 and then the animals were exposed to the magnetic field for 5 weeks so what we observed was that uh, the animal survival was very very high around 78% after the combination group there was now this is very important because there was a spontaneous uh, evacuation of bladder so urinary bladder dysfunction is again one of the very you know severe problems of spinal cord injury and uh, so in this within 10 to 12 days the animals were able to spontaneously evacuate the bladder this is representing the locomotor score so we can see that in all the groups there although there was a spontaneous gradual recovery and all of us do say that whenever there is a injury generally is associated with spontaneous recovery so spontaneous recovery was there but what is more important is that after giving the nanoparticles and magnetic field stimulation the recovery was induced from the first uh, first day first week itself and then there is a gradual improvement from the third week even the magnetic field group was able to show uh, better locomotor behaviors 
the again the lesion was volume was drastically reduced now this was the most significant uh, work or achievement of our study was that we saw whether the scar is being formed because we were targeting that if you are using magnetic fields along with nanoparticles whether we are able to abolish the scar so as you can see in the sci group this is mesentrichum staining which is uh, staining the collagen tissue so it was a dense seed like structure very dense uh, collagenous uh, fibers there were an intricate network was formed indicating formation of scar with it even in nanoparticle group although in magnetic field group this uh, the density was quite reduced but what happens in nanoparticle plus mf group was it was completely abolished so this was the first time we had reported and believe me within one month this paper of ours got pub accepted as well as published in inter international journal of nanomedicine so since the scarring was removed totally abolished so we thought let's see what is happening to the axonal regeneration whether they are able to cross the lesion site or not there so we used gap 43 growth associated protein 43 amino reactivity and we were able to see axonal sprouts as you can see here these are the axonal sprouts and these were the regenerating fibers which was crossing the lesion site so there were establishment of these uh, regenerating fibers and therefore sort of partial reestablishment of the connections now, now the next step was that whether these connections are only morphological or structural or they are functional so therefore we did lot of electrophysiological studies i am just presenting one so this is a monosynaptic reflex which is h reflex and what we observed that in mf group and npa plus mf group both the groups the threshold intensity required was quite less and indicating that these fibers were excitable and they were functional <laughs> so from these studies uh, uh, what we suggested was that magnetized iron oxide nanoparticles they actually augment the functional and morphological recovery in spinal cord injury rats which is induced by magnetic field stimulation by promoting neuroplasticity and regeneration so this work uh, has been reported uh, in times of india last year now getting uh, motivated by these findings in 2018 we thought okay let's if we can take this study our bedside work to bedside and therefore again uh, i discussed this with the professor vike gupta professor dinda professor bhavagar professor deepak kochar ma'am and everybody and we made a team and we filed a project to dbt after a long struggle for 2 years in 2020 the project 90 lakh projects was sanctioned to initiate the clinical trials however corona came and therefore we had to stop the work for approximately one and a half years now in this study there were two phases so we have started with and nearly completed the phase 1 in which we were trying to establish the clinical efficacy of tms and trying to develop certain prognostic markers or diagnostic markers using tms so the phase 1 study had uh, sham stimulation group which is so this was a randomized control study in which we had a placebo control so the coil was placed on the scalp as we do for tms generally giving tms stimulation but magnetic stimulation was not passed so there was no stimulation only the coil was placed in the active group then we had two groups now the concept of having two groups was that rtms as we call is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation actually is the gold standard classical gold standard which most of the clinicians all over india has been using but we but for spinal cord injury patients since they generally are on stretchers it becomes very difficult if they have to lay lie down for 45 minutes or 50 minutes therefore professor nand kumar who is an expert in the institute for tms he suggested that we can use intermittent theta burst stimulation so this was this pattern time of tms was is a very recent discovery and has been number of now clinicians are using it so we thought okay let's see if there any is difference between the efficacy of these two type of procedures so one is rtms and the other one is itbs and therefore we had two active groups and these were randomly divided so uh, so we recruited within last one year we had screened 66 patients they were randomly divided into three groups and finally we landed with only 16 patients so we had to include number of uh, exclude number of patients and inclusion criteria was that they were from 18 years to 60 years with the asia scale a and b they should be having traumatic injury so th since this was the first study of india so we thought let's include only the traumatic injury patients and with complete uh, sci injury and within 3 4 3 to 4 months of injury now again since for our hypothesis was that when we wanted to start the magnetic field intervention at the earliest 
so that what we had seen in animal models that scar is not being formed so we were trying to prevent the formation of scar and therefore we included only those patients who had injury of 3 to 4 months because in human beings it takes on an average 6 months for the scar to be formed so to be on the safer side we took patients at the earliest within within 3 months preferably and then those patients who had any neurological orthopedic diseases or any sort of ferromagnetic implants or even were on not stable, unstable patients on ventilator were excluded. Now the work of stimulation was uh, and also for recording the electrophysiological parameters, it was carried out in Brain Stimulation Lab of Department of Physiology as well as Center of Excellence Neuromodulation in Psychiatry Department. Our protocols of RTMS and ITBS was that uh, after the surgery, so we had recruited the patients before surgery and then after the surgery we went, we took their informed content and after the surgery means after 10 to 15 days of surgery. So once their sutures were removed, then we enrolled the patients and uh, then we recorded all the electrophysiological and other psychosocial parameters. The intervention was given only for 5 days because most of these patients were from out of Delhi. Although we did uh, arrange for their stay in the Dharamshala and other places, but still uh, they were slightly uncomfortable. So we gave only for five days, but then within one day, the two sessions were given. So at an interval of two, two hours, we gave two sessions. So in total, there were 10 sessions. The after five days, then again, the assessment was done and follow up was done at one, two and three months. Once the session, this uh, uh, intervention was over, then we or requested the PMR department and rehabilitation of SI patients was done uh, in collaboration with PMR where their strengthening exercises and other type of exercises was uh, given to them and then so that they could recover and we then recorded number of electrophysiological and other type of psychological psychosocial parameters. Uh, now I request uh, Ms. Diksha Patel who is actually the PhD student and has been working on this project and really did lot of hard work in getting the patient, standardizing most of the techniques to present the results. Thank you, ma'am, and good afternoon, all. Till now, we have recruited total 16 patients, is between most of them is between 20 to 40 years, and the thoraco, uh, thoraco lumbar injury. The cause of injury mainly are the road traffic accident and fall from height, and all are uh, with the Asia grade A. Th that is, they are paralyzed, they are uh, para para paraplegic patients. So, after the uh, this is the these are the representative cases. There are few videos from our study. The first patient, she uh, she is the uh, her history. She fall from a height of first floor, and the injury level was L1. She came uh, she came on uh, she came on a stretcher, and we start giving the intervention for five days. After completion the therapy before completion the therapy the pre walking index was zero. That is she is unable to walk. After completion the therapy. She, she got strength in her lower limbs and she started moving with the help of walkers without any assistance and without any braces. So the post walking index was 13. The post walking index 13 represents that the patient is moving with the help of walker without any braces and without the help of any assistance. So, in the second, in, in the, for the second patient, we have given a RTM, is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation for 20 minutes for a 10 session. After the, after, once the session is completed, after, at the end of 10 session, the patient was able to sit independently without any uh, assistance. And at the end of one month, after the therapy, simultaneously the physiotherapy has been given in the PMR department, the patient was able to stand independently with the help of parallel bars and the braces. So the pre-walking index was zero in this case too and after the uh, after one month the pre-walking index was five. That is the patient is a, the patient is able to stand with the help of parallel bars and the braces without any assistance. In the, in the case of third patient, again we have given the RTMS therapy, the patient is also came on suture with the ACI score A. So the level of injury in this patient was L1. After the after completion of the therapy, 
uh, she also able to able to sit without any assistance and after 2 month of therapy with the physio along with the physiotherapy the patient start walking with the help of walker and the braces so the pre walking index was zero initially but after the two, uh, after the end of 2 months the po uh, the walking index increases up to 9 and 9 represent then patient can walk independently without any assistant with the help of walker and the braces the walking index which i, I have already explained in the placebo group uh, after the completion of therapy that is t1 the uh, uh, the score has changed from 0 to 1 and after the uh, com uh, after one month that is t2 the score has increased from 0 to 3 for rtms both rtms and itbs group and then the spinal cord independence measure it has three subdomain first is self care self care include the grooming eating and the bathing behavior of the patient then the respiration and then the respiration and sphincter management and the mobility mobility is from bed to wheelchair wheelchair to cart ground to wheelchair and the outdoor and indoor mobility so in in the in the interventional group as you can see the mobility has increased in the rtm both rtms and significantly in, increase in both rtms and itbs group compared to the placebo group the pain has also reduced in both rtms and itbs group after the intervention and the depression and anxiety has also decreased in these groups so, which represent that quality of life in these spinal cord injury patient has improved after the intervention. To establish the prognostic marker using TMS in spinal cord injury, we have recorded the motor threshold, motor evoke potential, silent period and the recruitment curve. So, motor threshold has decreased in the RTMS group and the ITBS group after the therapy. Motor evoke potential at motor threshold has increased in RTMS group and the cortical silent period. The duration of cortical silent period measured the intracortical inhibition. Uh, intracortical inhibition due to the GABAergic neurons, interneurons. So it has decreased in RTMS and ITBS group, which, which represent that the inhibition, the GABA inhibition has decreased after the intervention and cortical excitability has increased. In the recruitment curve, so recruitment curve basically is the recruitment of motor unit with respect in response to the increasing stimulation intensity. So as as we increase the stimulation in intensity, more number of motor units has been recruited. So for the placebo group, both pre and post interventional, the increase the MEP amplitude has increased mildly from 10 microvolt to up to 100 microvolt. So in, and in the interventional group, in the pre-interventional group, the data remain, um, data remains same as the placebo group that the increase is mild from 10 to 100 microvolt at the 80% of intensity. But in the post-interventional group, the MEP amplitude has increased from 10 microvolt to up to 2000 microvolt, which shows the increase in cortical excitability after the stimulation. So we propose that. The, so we from this data we have, we have proposed that the motor threshold and the recruitment curve can serve as the prognostic marker in spinal cord injury measure. Now I would like to invite ma'am to discuss the results. Yeah, thank you, Diksha. So as you can see from the results that uh, whether we give ITBS or RTMS stimulation, it is highly effective in promoting locomotor recovery as well as it has improved lot of psychosocial parameters, independent score, walking index, depression, anxiety. And uh, that though ITBS and RTMS are equally effective, however, ITBS, as I was saying, is patient friendly because the duration of the procedure is only for three minutes. And so uh, two sessions can be given in a day, three minutes separated, two hours and then three minutes. And for spinal cord injury patients, actually it is very comfortable. So. Uh, ITBS is, we are recommending ITBS in spinal cord injury patients and as prognostic marker though we still need to do more analysis and we have to correlate that what was the severity of injury or how much was the recovery with the recruitment curves or with the motor threshold. So we need to do more analysis but as of now we can say that motor threshold and 
these recruitment cuts can be a reliable prognostic markers in SCL. So from these studies, we say that ITBS can be recommended as an integral component of rehab program in complete SCI patients for achieving locomotive recovery and improving quality of life. So we are more or less through with the phase one of the study where when we have shown and we have seen that ITBS is really effective in locomotor recovery. Now we are ready to go into phase two uh, part of the study wherein we will be now injecting nanomedicine or the uh, nanoparticles into the patients and along with the TNS. So I request uh, Professor Dinda, Amit uh, Dinda who is expert in nanotechnology and has been collaborating for us for last 15 years to give a brief overview of nanotechnology. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Suman. Now, as you know, now nano application is uh, very well established. This is a uh, diagram which is available in the website. If you see, these are the large number of areas where nanoparticles are being used. Your uh, cell phone, in the car. In the, um, um. Now, if you see the, these are the application area of the nanotechnology. Because of time, I'm not going to the details. I think the, these are, I have listed these areas where it is in the clinical practice now. It has gone beyond the uh, clinical trial and some of the things are now coming into the market also. Give you example, the um, antimicrobial, I think silver nanoparticle being used extensively in the uh, wound, wound area. And uh, but today we will be concentrating mostly in the area where I think Simone is working. The different faculties apart from us also has initiated a lot of work in the nano in AIMS. But I think interdisciplinary area is becoming very important and out of which the spion that is uh, the uh, super paramagnetic uh, iron oxide nanoparticle which the uh, Suman is using. This was actually developed in our lab quite long back and we have given these to uh, Dr. Mohanty's lab in stem cell where we have shown for stem cell tracking. For stem cell, it was totally non-toxic and you can track them even in, in the animal in vivo condition. Now, so when uh, we discussed with Suman, then I realized that this spion can be easily used for uh, hard experimentation. Now, these are quite magnetic and use of this spion, if you see, they are in the specialized imaging they are being used nowadays and, um, and then also the magnetic activated sol cell sorting, I think these you are, uh, some of you are already uh, using in your lab. Stem cell labeling, labeling and tracking is also the, the kits are available which are iron oxide based uh, system. And uh, the COVID testing, the, even in our lab we produce a lot of iron nanoparticle and supply to different companies. And uh, so it, it enhances the viral conjugation and also separation. Now the the theranostic component that is imaging and drug delivery is the one where iron oxide nanoparticles are also being used. You have to realize that this is among the different metals, this is a non-toxic one. And only issue is that this degradation is a little slow. But then if you give a very small size like 20 to 30 nanometer, I think your uh, size is around 50 nanometer. So they will be pretty good and biocompatible and also uh, non-reactive. So the last part, as it is being used in the tissue engineering sector, so what we have devised for applications of Sumans, she is doing in our lab, we are using the gelatin matrix and uh, the partially actually polymerizing them with use of genepin, which are all US approved and inside that we are loading these iron oxide nanoparticles. Now these will be made in a more of a soldier kind of situation and uh, during the initial when the patient will come, I think the orthopedic surgeon can infiltrate it in the area of injury, spinal cord injury and then from outside the magnetic stimulation can be given. And our own experience with the iron oxide nanoparticle and cellular interaction is that they usually enter into the cell and stay in that vicinity for quite long time. So the advantage would be, so the cyclical magnetic stimulation will be very effective in that area. And the one of these articles we published long back where we have shown iron oxide nanoparticle toxicity of the different cell lines and we have shown it is pretty same almost result which uh, Dr. Suman has shown up to 100 microgram uh, uh, per ml concentration is too high we will be using very low concentration. So I think the safety wise and as well as biocompatibility wise 
it has got a huge potential and we hope that the clinical trial will be quite successful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So what we have planned is that uh, now the material hydrogel system is ready, INOPs is ready. And we have discussed with Dr. Bhavuk, Dr. Manoj is also who was there, Dr. Deepa Gupta will be joining in. So that during surgery, that after the patient comes to AIMS trauma center, they undergo decompression surgery or fusion surgery. So during the surgeries, this SON gel will be injected at multiple places in the lesion site. And then we'll wait for 10 days as we generally do for all the patients. And thereafter, we'll start giving them uh, these uh, ITBS sessions that I had shown you earlier. So, since RTMS is uh, one of the integral part of our project, Professor Nand Kumar is a big support. He has been supporting us for since long we started this study. He is not able to join us today. He had some family issues. His, his wife is admitted. So, we have Dr. Shubham, who is a senior resident in psychiatry. He will be just briefing about uh, what is RTMS and what is the principle behind it. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Shibham. I'm a senior resident in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, uh, forgive me for my sore throat. Uh, so, RDMS is the first non invasive painless, promising neural circuitry modulation technique, and it has been used in the uh, in various fields that is psychiatry, neuropsychiatry, and neurology, and is being evolved in other areas also. Right. So. What is RTMS? What is TMS? It's transcranial magnetic stimulation and it uses pulse magnetic field. So I think most of us are uh, well known with the fact that, well known with the uh, theory that Faraday had, Faraday had given, Michael Faraday, about the fact that changing magnetic field induces an electric field uh, uh, in the area where it is being changed. So the same principle is being applied in transcranial magnetic stimulation and uh, it induces an electrical current in the cerebral cortex. So there are two effects that the stimulation has. It could be uh, depolarization or it could be hyperpolarization. Hyper so generally high frequency uh, RTMS induces a depolarization effect and low frequency induces a hyperpolarization effect. And it induces controlled and controllable manipulations in behavior. So how does it work? Uh, so I have briefly described before also and uh, it uses a rapidly changing magnetic field to induce weak electrical currents through pulses induced by electromagnetic induction and the penetration of this particular uh, stimulation technique is only 2 to 3 cm inside the brain. So it generally reaches up to the superficial cortical areas. So the penetration is that the pulses penetrate skin and skull and it stimulates or inhibits the superficial cortical regions. So there is a depolarization of neurons in the DLPFC and it causes local neurotransmitter release. To this there is repolarization of pyramidal neurons in the DLPFC and this, this uh, stim depolarization also causes neurotransmitter release in the deeper brain neurons. So it not only uh, stimulates the neurotransmitter release in the superficial cortex, but through this, it stimulates the deeper brain areas also. And the activation of deeper brain areas then has, has secondary effects on the superficial cortex. So there is a feedback mechanism that goes on. So this is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and this is the anterior cingulate cortex. And they have, uh, uh, you know, a feedback kind of thing going on between the two. So these effects are associated with improvements in the target symptoms. So there are various protocols in uh, transcranial magnetic simulation. These are high frequency and low frequency protocols. And uh, the high frequency generally causes uh, depolarization and the uh, low frequency causes the inhibitory effect on the neurons. And on top of that, there are newer protocols which uses theta burst simulation. So theta burst simulations have pulses of uh, three, three pulses at 50 hertz uh, frequency and these the pulses uh, are given at a frequency of 5 hertz. So, uh, and there is an inter-train interval. So, this is a particular train in which 50 hertz of 3 pulses are given at 5 hertz that is separated by 200 milliseconds and this particular uh, train is then separated by an inter-train interval of 10 to 20 seconds. So, what happens is that uh, the amount of stim the intensity of stimulus that is needed and the time that is needed to uh, have the desirable effects is quite less 
as compared to the regular RTMS or uh, the regular high frequency or low frequency RTMS. So this is one of the advantage that the theta burst protobus process and that is being used in the study protocol it seems. So with that I would conclude and I would request. Thank you Dr. Shubha. So uh, TMS basically has an advantage, best advantage that it is non-invasive. Okay, And second advantage is that when you are giving a TMS, it has minimal side effects because the magnetic fields are able to close the skull without any interference and it generally doesn't result in contractions of muscles. Earlier in spinal cord injury, the electrical stimulation was being provided and therefore the patient used to get severe headaches. So that is being, that is being avoided in TMS and definitely it is a non-invasive technique. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Bhavuk. So when I went to him two years back in 2018 that uh, he is a spine surgeon, spine expert, that I want to do this project. I was very apprehensive, but he was very positive. <laughs> so he said, ma'am, we'll do it. And we'll do start from complete spinal cord injury patients. And with him support, actually, I was able to initiate this project. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So as ma'am introduced me spine surgeon, but actually it is a department of physiology which makes me spine surgeon. Otherwise, I was just a spine physician. So I thank you. I thank Professor Deepak and Professor Kocha that we will be, uh, they will keep us busy as spine surgeon and we will keep on providing the support. So yes, uh, like, you know, the, the, kind, the kind of support which physiology, the department of physiology provides us is, you know, intraoperative neuromonitoring support. So that, you know, uh, that prevents the intraoperative spinal cord injuries. So this is one form of spinal cord injury uh, and this is the another form of spinal cord injury which we are treating like a traumatic spinal cord injuries. And But the believe me, I think you all will be agree that the spinal cord injury itself is very devastating and it is catastrophic for the, for the patient. And we know that we have seen in our data also that it happens most of the time in most productive age groups. So the, uh, the again the consequences they are far reaching. So actually, you know, everything is lost for usually for these patients. But even if we are uh, getting the improvement of one or two grades, it makes a lot of difference to the patient's life. And I, I will say that this is not the holy grail, but I think that is a great step. And this will be the beginning of, you know, uh, uh, area because many trials, including stem cells and everything, they have not shown such type of results so far. So I think um, this will be a game changer and we will soon be getting many more results and many more improvements in this protocol. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhavak. I think with your support and support of neurosurgeons, we should be able to go ahead and spread the message. I think that's what uh, we are trying to do, that not in an institute, if we can spread this message, spread the word or tell other neurosurgeons or orthopedicians that this is going to work. So now I invite uh, Dr. Manoj. Just few words. Uh, he's also got great support, so getting a lot of patience now from him. And then Dr. Geeta, a few lines from you also. I uh, I joined this project only recently, but uh, I, I've known Dr. Suman for quite long. Uh, the moment I came to know about uh, the project which is going on and the results promised or rather I, I would like to say yet to be translated into clinical practice are promising enough to get me excited and uh, I believe most of the spine surgeons will be eagerly looking forward to uh, the results of phase 2 of this trial. Having said that, uh, I, I believe that this will open another interesting area of recovery in patients who suffer iatrogenic injuries. So uh, we talk of spinal cord injuries uh, as traumatic injuries. Most of the times these trials are conducted on patients who have had come with primary trauma. But as neurosurgeons, we operate a lot of spinal cord pathologies. And uh, sometimes patients land up with unwanted deficits. So I do believe that this, this project has far greater implications than which we are doing currently. Uh, thank you, Dr. Subhan Jain, for giving me this platform. 
Uh, first, I would like to say that uh, 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 the spinal cord injury is really a devastating thing and it really puts a patient's life out of care. So, it is not just a physical domain, it is mental, psychological, vocational, educational, so many things that get affected. So, uh, it's a great thing that we are starting early on and trying to influence the outcomes. And in rehabilitation, we just don't work on the uh, physiotherapy part, we do the occupational therapy, medical management, uh, psychological intervention, uh, interventions, other interventions which are required for spasticity, for pain, for bladder bowel. So, uh, I am looking forward to more work in this area where we can do this uh, process in the chronic spinal cord injury also, use it in spasticity, bowel bladder as already been uh, suggested. So, I think definitely it is a promising area and we look forward to more results to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Geeta and uh, Dr. Manoj. So, uh, what Dr. Geeta was saying, so we already have in line the current and future directions that first of all, definitely we will be initiating phase 2 trials very soon. And then uh, another protocol is more or less ready for another PhD student where we will be checking the ITBS efficacy for neurogenic bladder, gait and other type of symptomology. And definitely then chronic SCI survivors because we are getting lot of phone calls from actually patients who are chronic survivors, they have been living with them for 6 years or 10 years. So, this is just the beginning and first step where we thought let's establish and see whether ITBS or nanotechnology is effective or not. Then we are in the department uh, trying to establish diagnostic and prognostic markers using TMS for various conditions. Along with that, I have a love for animal experimentation. I am a physiologist, baker scientist. So, we have ITB, uh, TMS, advanced setup of TMS in brain stimulation for uh, uh, brain stimulation lab for animals also, for rats. So, exactly the same protocols which we are using in human patients will be using in animals and will try to understand the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms in these neuro various neurotraumatic or neurodegenerative disorders. I would like to acknowledge all my mentors. Professor Usha Naya, Professor Ashmi Mathu, definitely she was the one who believed in me, gave me this idea and uh, they made me think out of the box. Professor Y.K. Gupta was supposed to join but I think he got stuck. So, he was also very motivating and Professor K.K. Deepak, actually during Corona times, he was really supportive. We were coming to the department and I could procure all the equipments during Corona time. So, we didn't get the patients but we established the lab for both animals and humans. Professor Kochal, uh, Ma'am is also supportive, Dr. Tinda, Dr. Nantma, Bhavok, Nisham, Dr. Deepak Gupta, all my students, PhD in post, PhD research scholars and the funding agencies which is very important, DST, DBT and ICMR. This is my research group. Uh, thanks to all of you and now I will invite uh, Professor Kochal for final words. Thank you all uh, for coming here. Uh, spending your precious time on Holy Eve. What I wanted to say was that thanks to Professor Deepak who started, you know, autonomic function testing and then vascular function testing and able support of our dear colleagues, two very dynamic uh, gentlemen, Dr. Ashok Jaryal and Dr. Rajkumar Yadav. Our department, I would just like to introduce that we are on the interface and uh, somehow we don't do night duties we don't do ward rounds, we don't do ICU except for our animal care facility. So, we would welcome more collaborations from you uh, both in uh, neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, trauma and we shall be able to give you the physiological uh, correlates both in terms of optical imaging, in terms of, you know, muscle rehabilitation like body composition analysis is a very good setup which tells us about muscle mass elimination and we have done. So, uh, the same equipment, if we can put it to novel uses, that is where AIMS as a brand for academic research, clinical care and uh, also the what we call the connectome approach, you know, having friends in the right places at the right time, it leads to good things happening and as Bhavok said, game changer. So, I congratulate everybody that this is a beginning and we will seek your active cooperation and future collaboration. As uh, Aristotle said in metaphysics, you know, this is a 
quotation which I borrowed from your husband from his MS thesis that the search for truth is in some ways very easy and in some ways very hard. But if each one of us adds some component of knowledge, then the whole thing achieves a great grandeur. So thank you very much. Happy Holi. Now it's my pleasure to invite, uh, if you have any queries or suggestions or comments. Professor Bal, sir. Sir, your please suggestions. And uh, unfortunately, we have taken the pharmacy, only time and died of nothing has come out. So, at least, people are going to be in the same direction. Some person may interest, and then he disappears. So, that's so not happening. It should be created in functional, clinical, physiology. And in fact, the old days we used to read uh, some sometimes clinical results. You see, the GFR part supposed to be done by the development part. So they have to put the best people in the GFR. So it takes that I'm getting something. And then another randomized group of this will get the same treatment. Then if there is a difference, then only you can say this. I am a scientist. Two years back, the same tablets, which is a blessing, but the written price was 10 cents. The other one had written $2. You know what was the effect size? You know what is the effect size means? Why it is given placebo versus the intervention minus. So that is the effect size. So the effect size is so placebo has a huge, huge effect size. So is it because it's coming and getting the results? Is some way you know, like the thirty-nine percent of brain students because they say linear question that uh, they don't understand the human brain. It's one number two to understand how the lives come from inner to organic cells. That's the right to say. And third, to understand the universe. So these three are the linear process. One thousand years we have to understand these three processes. The boundary is great. So how it works? How do we know? We have seen so let's do biomarkers, let's do some treatment and see the effect size. And then randomize the cases. And then on the catalytic process, we give some treatment, some effect. Okay, how do we know that this effect is because of the special effect or because of the true magnetic field? Because you are not doing any electrophysiological study, you are not doing any biomolecular study. When you send it to publication in high impact journals, they will raise all these questions and reject it. Yeah, thank you, sir. But uh, uh, if I can answer that question. The number of patients, total 50, is so small. Is a lot of Sir, uh, if I can answer, so first of all, we got ethical clearance from the institute only for doing 15 patients in these three months. So that is one. But secondly, secondly, sir, again, uh, to further add, this is a double blind randomized control study. So, double blind means we have a physiotherapist who was doing the assessment part, then there was another student who was giving the therapeutic interventions. So, they didn't know that uh, which intervention is being given and then the randomization was done with the help of the statistician. Yeah. When the statistics, you say my salary and this is my salary divided by two, so I get some three million. But definitely, very very Increase the sample size, do it, try to scientifically prove that it will be very good. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Share with you. We are having about 15 randomized clinical trials right now running in our department. Professor Yadav is sitting here and he has had a great history. Two decades he has been just doing integral and and as you said, biomarkers, proteomics, the whole gamut of it. We are also having a randomized clinical trial 
from human patients to animal models, right from the brain gut axis neuromodulation, probiotic based in one arm and the RTMS and the theta burst in the two other arms. Again, the translational approach to engage analysis to batch clamp technique in the animal model treatment. She is doing it in Parkinson's disease. So, sir, we do respect your point and we point well taken, but sir, we need your encouragement and active inputs like today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I think we can close the session today after the last word from Professor Deepak, who has been our stalwart and mentor. And because we have to attend five uh, generations. Dr. Anjana, I missed saying she is also doing very advanced clinical research physiology and developing well, newer innovative techniques. So we are on the learning curve. So maybe people like you giving us inputs will increase the slope. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and it's new uh, far advanced. Application, clinical application, and very basic, and highly involved with this scenario. I take your point well, and it is 15 patient permission target. In next phase, you go double and triple by showing your confidence. They are right, but he's correct. You have to actually quantify, and why not 100? Once you show 15, you will get permission. Now, I'll go further. Giving a uh, nanoparticle electromagnetic estimation, find the theory. Find what is the long term effect. So that kind of effect should be seen. You should follow them up because these patients are the 40 plus or 50 and they still have 20 years to go. So that kind of you should go for long term follow up all these effects. What will be beneficial? So we have, you have a project, you have a project, we look that way. But the angle which comes from the other side is always good. Long term consequences, positive, negative, maybe more positive or maybe less negative, should be accomplished. Yes, thank you, sir. People be here. Thank you very much. All the best. I love this department. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, on Neurons are not cells of connective tissue. Neurons are not cells of epithelial tissue. If you have got an improvement with neurons, then it is a definitive and final. It is, you cannot play with neurons. Neurons are terminally differentiated cells, and once they are damaged or they die off, there is no scope of any improvement unless your therapy is perfect. So I want to uh, highlight this one. But I would also like, uh, I would have been very good, data is very good, very promising work. I would have only wish that you had shown us your back data on the spinal cord input, on the gate analysis and all that, uh, transferior magnetic simulation of the, of the spinal cord input, physiological practice. Sir, actually I just chose few slides because of the time restriction, but we have done extensive studies and published all of them. Uh, I think I'll discuss with you something. Yes, because each of these patients are, uh, are very neuronal damage and they cannot improve just like that with the pressure. Yes. There, there has to be something scientific going on here to improve that. Yes. And you, are, you are absolutely correct. We have this uh, permission with uh, the first phase clinical trial as well as the DVD grant which she has got after reading extensive preclinical data. So all these uh, models, data validation with the RAT model, complete transaction, partial transaction, with all kind of documentation data are there. Otherwise, data permission for a even 15 uh, clinical trial is human. So this will be the first in human study, FIHVKL. FI is very difficult to get permission. So we had all these data and the uh, experts must have reviewed it and they only give us the permission. And also the various modes of spinal cord injury, whether it's a confusion model or an impact, or it is a cutting, a heavy section, a parcel section, or a complete transaction. So, but because traumatic brain injury and the trauma center is such a big one, I remember Professor Mishra telling us that how with our modern lifestyle, there are a lot of injuries 
both road traffic accidents as well as self harm accidents or some push or whatever. And we are having very young, productive people landing up like this, and we need to help. Thank you. Thank you. With your permission, can we close to this? Thank you, everyone.